Cumulus history with hardware has been, you know, eight years ago, we were actually looking at Flash back then. Um, and we built our first prototype systems actually on all Flash. Um, but what we realized pretty quickly is that this is really great technology, but the economics for the customer doesn't make sense right now. Eight years ago, it was, it was you know, obscenely expensive for Flash. But we realized that Flash was really a key way that we could build hardware for our software and provide great performance while getting great economics by combining those with hard drives. And so the first systems we actually shipped were hybrid based because all flash just economically didn't make sense in the marketplace back then. So I wanted to start with where we always try to start with Accumulo is the customer. So let me just talk about three customers here and then we'll talk more about use cases in general. Um, we really see ourselves as building a, a data platform that helps customer power their applications and their services. Um, and we have a customer that has recently converted from SAN into a pure all flash, all NVMe system. And really they wanted to have something dramatically simpler than the SAN and give them better economics than having to manage the fiber channel infrastructure that goes along with that. They wanted to have the flexibility to let their editors and, and people working on the content be sitting anywhere in the building leveraging the corporate infrastructure. But it was also key that the system be massively scalable. They're dealing with a large amount of data and they wanted to make sure that they're able to get out content that reinforces their new product launches that happen on a regular basis quickly. Um, because without good content in a product launch, as we know, they don't always go as well. So they wanted to be able to have that stuff released timely without the complexity and management that they had with their existing SAN infrastructure. On the data analytics side, we, this, this customer is doing research around um, infectious diseases and, and, uh, and are quite applicable to what we're doing right now. This is actually IHME. And this customer needs the ability to analyze a massive amount of data to figure out patterns and uh, and understand what those effects will be um, on the population and on uh, different therapies that they can apply. And so uh, this customer is actually using a hybrid system and it's very important that the cache work very well for them because they have a very high performance workload and they need that caching algorithm to work well. And so the caching that we provide them makes it easy for them to manage and hits the right economic profile for them because they are hospital that are also doing other things and they're investing a lot of their resources into people and not necessarily infrastructure. And so they wanna be able to provide great infrastructure for those, for those people doing this research, but at the same time, they don't have an infinite budget to work with. And so it's important that they balance that line of cost and, and performance. Um, and so for, for them, Cumulo has made it very easy to scale and deliver the performance needed to do this analysis. And then finally, we have a massive retail chain that, that really wanted to have a partner moving forward in the world around their data platform. They wanted something flexible, um, but they really wanted to, to con consolidate how they manage their unstructured data and, and partner with us in that process. Now this system, this customer went with an all NVMe solution because they really wanted to remove the storage bottleneck out of the equation completely to give a net result of a great customer experience for their customers. Um, and they really wanted to move away from spinning disks inside their data centers. They saw that as an overhead and they wanted to move away from that so that you don't have to go into the data center and replace drives as often uh, with, with Flash being having much higher reliability. So we actually, uh, you know, we, we started in the media and entertainment world. We, we did batch processing and we've, we worked really well with that. That's kind of uh, been, been our entry point, but it turns out that that workload and as we've developed our software and our hardware together, have made it, the solution work in many different scenarios. And now our customer base is much wider and we have content from rich media to, to lighter files like analytics to general purpose file. And I'm sure you see a slide like this from all your vendors, but let's talk about the actual use cases we see in our customer base. So the top 10 uh, use cases we see um, today are, are these here. And I'll just talk about the first three and then we can, we can open up the conversation to anything else that looks interesting here that people would like to talk about. Um, in the video and audio editing world, the file is the lifeblood of their business. That is uh, everything they do is a file and has to go through this file workflow. And so they really need scale and performance 
and they need the system to be highly available, right? If the, if the system goes down, it affects their releasing of content, it affects their revenue, it affects their reputation in the marketplace. So it's very critical that the storage perform well, be simple to manage, and be available. Um, and they're also dealing with scales where the cost per terabyte really matters. So there's still an economic equation here that has to be satisfied as well. They don't, it, while it is the lifeblood of their business, oftentimes the margins are not huge on these things and they need to make sure that they've got cost-effective storage at the same time. Hey, Jason. Yeah. The video and audio editing is great, but more, more or less it's, it's like, a, uh, you know, let's say a film would come into existence and they're doing that for, for quite a while until that's finished and then they've got a new workload that comes in. It's almost like bring the workload into, into you know, processing and then archive it and bring a new workload. Is, it, is, it that, is that the sort of thing that's going on there? Yeah, actually, Keith, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? I think you got a little bit better. Yeah, it, honestly, Ray, it, it, it's a little bit of both. You know, we have, especially now with, with movies that have were supposed to be released in May that are now potentially being released in November, they have gone from, you know, nonlinear editing, you know, where they're adding visual effects, they're adding content, they're doing all of the, the audio and video alignment to now they're basically archived until the release date gets done. And, and a lot of the cases that those videos need to not be put on cold storage because you know, the, the producers and directors are now taking this, this additional time to add more content, more, more flair to it. So even, um, even in the archive space where you know, these post houses that are doing some of this work, they need the, the content to still have a level of performance that allows them to go in and make edits to it. Um, you know, outside of the, the world we currently live in, our video and audio editing is is one of the, the higher performing workloads that we get. Mm. Um, you know, because you've got the number of different- 4K and 8K and all that stuff okay, coming out. 16K is now like one of the things. We have we have two customers currently doing 16K on us. Oh. And, and, and it, put, it stresses the system and, and Cumulo, Cumulo just continues pushing it. And, and that's where- we're starting to see a lot of um, of our value prop resonating because not only can we handle those those formats, but the analytics that we provide shows the editors, the administrators, and the end users how their storage is actually working as they push the limits of, of the new latest and greatest technology. Okay. The other thing I would add to that too is the reason this is our number one use case, um, certainly Hollywood and those types of, um, you know, big cinematic type of productions are run on Cumulo, but enterprises and corporations are doing so much video now too, whether it's training videos, advertising videos, um, their own content, that what we find is within an enterprise, their IT system that they use for um, user directories, for example, historically often doesn't work very well for those environments. And so they'll bring in a Cumulo um, to supplement their IT systems for their own internal work. So lots and lots of clusters sitting for video projects within enterprise as well, which I find interesting. Okay, thanks. Quick question, follow up on um, uh, the earlier question on the um, media entertainment. Keith. Um, you know, the big thing for, for these production companies, as you guys know, is, you know, they got their dailies and it's the offload from that flash. Mm -hmm. How, what's the, what's that performance that, that you guys have with the offload when they're, when they're dumping their dailies? So Jason has a slide where we're going to talk about okay. our intelligent caching and our predictive analytic, um, our predictive prefetch. But one of the great things about Cumulo, and this is a great segue into Jason's slides about this, is that, um, in, in legacy systems, those dailies have to be pushed down and they set policies that the file system now has to go and move them to a different tier. With Cumulo, we, we basically have intelligence built in that mo but really monitors the heat of the system and the heat of each individual block. So a daily will automatically get moved based on its hit rate. And Jason will talk about that, but it takes a lot of the burden off the storage administrator. All right, so let's, let's talk about video surveillance. So, um... You know, video surveillance is about seeing the unseen, right? You're getting, you're, you're trying to see and, and capture all that's going on in your environment. Um, and storage should be a part of that solution. Um, and it, in the storage space for video surveillance, it really needs to be dead simple and reliable, right? It needs to be, I set it up and I really set it and forget it until it's time to go change it. Um, and that, cha that happens fairly often these days in the video surveillance world as camera 
resolutions continue to increase, as well as people wanting to add camera counts to different locations. And so we give you, with our system, it becomes really simple when it's time to make a change. If you need another video surveillance server to attach to more cameras that you're gonna deploy, the intelligence in our system makes it really transparent about how many more video surveillance servers you can add to the storage system without it, without the performance becoming a challenge because you have insight and you can see the connections and how much bandwidth is being consumed by each of these servers. But also because we can fill the system to 100% full, it makes it really dead simple to forecast on the capacity side as well. So, uh, 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 so the second time we talked about this 100% full thing, I, I'm just trying to understand what's different with Cumulo versus uh, you know, the competition. I, I don't know unless I talk too bad about the competition, but 100% full is pretty unusual for a storage system in my mind. It is. It is. Uh, can you explain what, what you're doing differently to do that? Keith, do you want to touch on that one? You want me to? Or you cool. want to hold up on that? I mean, it's up to you well, guys. When you turn a Cumulo system on, all of our, our, our data protection is already done. So you're getting like a block-based data protection, but it's, it's done in such a way that it allows us to scale massively. So when we show you 100 or 200 or a petabyte of, of data usable, that is 100% usable. There is obviously other storage under the covers that is just not shown to the end user. So when we tell a customer they get one petabyte of usable space, you can actually use all one petabyte of that space. And that's what we show you. All of the hot sparing, all of the file system overhead is already accounted for so that when a customer goes and says, you know, I'm at 80% full, normally vendors come and knock on their door saying it's time to upgrade or add more capacity. And we don't do that because the system is built to use all of the usable space in it with no performance degradation if a node goes offline, if a drive uh, fails. Okay. Uh, so and I'll just touch on the, the, the third one here, which is user directories. And yep, user directories still exist. And there's still, there's an amazing amount of collaboration and innovation that occurs in traditional home directories. But these are also often departmental shares and often used for research. And, a lot of times people just put this as generically the category that they're starting with and that over time that that system becomes not a single use but a, but a multi-use system for other applications and you start to see that consolidation that we were talking about and and the other benefit which we mentioned before is that you know it's a subscription our software is a subscription and includes all the functionality so it doesn't matter what type of system you buy, it's going to have everything. And so you've got replication built in. You can deal with your DR and backup solutions built in without having to pay for extra software to handle that problem. When it comes to very demanding workloads, HPC, EDA, those sorts of things where we have billions and billions of files, massive directory depth, hard links, soft links, all of those sorts of things, that's a very challenging area of storage for everybody. So how does how do you perform there um, and, and how do you you know mitigate some of the traditional problems that you see in those areas well a lot of it has to do with um the the hybrid design that we have where we leverage ssds um, our most active data sets always land on that highest performing tier of storage so a lot of the the mitigating factors really come in from the, the overall architecture of how our software lands data um you know, those very, really deep directories, you know, other file systems say, don't put more than 100,000 files in a single directory structure. We don't really say that because of how we handle metadata, where our metadata lands and is always pinned to SSD. Um, you know, and, you know, statting a file system, especially in like workloads like, like EDA, or when you have, um, you know, other types of very large data sets that have very, very small files that encompass tons of directory structures. Um, you know, it's just a matter of, of what the file system was built for in the time that it was built that allows us to employ, you know, new technologies that weren't around 20 years ago when when file systems that are really prevalent still today were, were built. And you, you really can't rely on 20 year old technology to service the data footprint with massive scale. Billions of files is not, unheard of. I and mean, we have a customer that has 70 terabytes of data and like 12 billion files. So, you know, it's not the, the problem of scale isn't always about capacity. It's about the data footprint. And, you know, in the world we live in, the data footprint is really about the number of files and how you manage it and how the system performs 
with that amount of file. And, and we have built a system that really manages metadata extremely well. And that's where large directory structure, you know, large uh, file count um, performance workloads, especially when it's random. And Jason kind of touched upon that is that you, you get the performance of flash with the capacity of spinning drive. And Jason's got some slides I think we can go to that will really there's highlight there's one that. point that I'm going to highlight there specific to HPC, and I'm a little bit of an HPC geek, so it's hard for me to not jump in on HPC stuff. But, um, you know, when you think about Cumulo and the fastest file systems in the world sitting behind the fastest supercomputers in the world, usually it's Lustre or BGFS or something that will be scratch for those environments. You often will not, you re, I, we really don't pitch Cumulo in the top 10 fastest supercomputers in the world for scratch. They may use us for the archive file system, which usually they have two different file systems because of our scale. But then as you get to the top 50, you know, the slightly smaller supercomputers, but they're still supercomputers, we'll often see our environment used for both Scratch as well as archive file system. Um, and also, as you think about HPC and the places where it's like video processing or image processing, telescope data, we're very commonly used in those areas as well. So there is a portion, you know, that top 0.1% of the market that BGFS and Lester are fit for, and we don't really try to fight out there. But all the rest of those use cases of where you'll typically see Cumulo and HPC. Quick question. Yeah. So does the variable block size that Cumulo employs add or uh, decrease to the performance of the systems? Because I know it, it helps with the efficiencies. So we don't actually use a variable block size. Uh, we, have, we have a fixed block size um, and uh, we distribute that across all of the systems. So you can kind of think of it like we're pre-allocating all of the storage that's underneath us on day one and presenting a usable space that can truly be filled and it's reserving as necessary for dry failures and node failures, et cetera. So there's not a performance variability because there isn't a variable box size. It's 8K. So um, when we looked at Flash, Flash is really interesting and we've been using it and leveraging it for a long time, but we've really been bottlenecked by the connection we've had to Flash, right? We've been putting them in these legacy form factors and this is where NVMe has really changed the game. It's really unlocking the full potential. So when we built our first all flash system, we purposely made it an all NVMe system. We didn't think it was appropriate to build an all flash system until the economics moved down to a point where it would be attractive for a customer, but also it needed to have a different performance profile in order to make, be truly valuable for a customer. So we, we launched our all flash product over two years ago um, because we, that, was, that was the time in which NVMe drives had, had matured to the right level that we felt it was time to adopt that and bring that value to the customer. And so today we give customers real choice when they're del delivering solutions on-prem. They can choose all NVMe if that's what they want. They don't want spinning disks. They have a really high performance workload like AI ML, high res video editing. They've got high speed rendering they're doing or they can choose the hybrid system, which is really going to give a great experience and our, our caching algorithm results in over 90% cache hit rates. So it feels like they're having an all flash system, but they aren't necessarily hitting the, having to pay the budgets that are required to deliver all flash. And so that's kind of the key difference between those two platforms and why we have both. And custom, giving customers choice is important because some people want to move forward with, with, with that. They want to move from spinning disks. Some people don't or don't have the budgets for that. And if we look at kind of, and this is a little bit of a busy chart, but if we look at, at what these solutions provide, hybrid solutions obviously have a lower cost dynamic. There's a lower cost per, per, per capacity and all NVMe solutions are going to be more expensive. And it's gonna be varied by the, the combination of the number of drives in a given node. But those systems at a per node level or per cluster level are going to deliver a very consistent performance and they're going to have a different performance profile. And you can see here with all NVMe, we get very consistent performance with really fast streams, right? If you look at the streaming writes here, it's, it's very fast and streaming reads are fast. So we get, we get workloads that we can do on all NVMe that we couldn't do with hybrid historically because they just have higher performance requirements or they have a lower latency requirement. Um, and so there's a lot of performance value here and whether this is NVMe or, uh, or a hybrid system, 
we're going to intelligently lever, leverage RAM and SSD if it's in the system. So let me talk a little bit about what we've, what we've hinted at is how we do the caching. So we find that over 95% of our data uh, transactions are returned in less than a millisecond. And that's, that's true on our hybrid systems as well. Um, it's even faster on all, all NVMe systems. And how we're doing that is, is basically three things. One is we are intelligently casting for fast random reads. So we're looking at the, the heat map of the, at a block layer and looking at the hot data and automatically keeping those things in cache in the SSD layer and evicting them as they get cold. And so no one's having to manage that process at all. But then we also wanna be able to deliver very fast streaming reads to systems, uh, particularly in, in, in intensive workloads that have large files or large sets of files. So the system intelligently looks at, am I accessing more data within a file? Let me go ahead and prefetch that. Or am I accessing, is there a pattern to this file? Is there a, a, a .001.002.003? Is there a pattern here that I can recognize and start to prefetch ahead? And what's cool is this system is intelligent. It's constantly adjusting. And if the data that is prefetched doesn't actually get used, it will back that off. And this is done at a per client granularity level. So you can have clients with one application that benefit a ton from this and other clients that don't. And the system is automatically tuning that as it's being used. And then finally, all our rights go to Flash. And again, this was foundational to our company. We didn't want to build specialized hardware componentry in our systems. We wanted to focus on the value of the software and put the work into the software so that no matter where you deployed Cumulo, you could take advantage of, our, of, of what we've built and not have to have a special part in the box to do that. And so as we use Flash, all Flash writes go to SSD and then we destage them to hard drives to, to optimize for the, the hard drive IO patterns which nets out a total cluster performance experience that's much higher because we're intelligently using the RAM, the SSDs, and, and, the, and the hard drives. And as you saw from the graphs be, uh, uh, before, NVMe obviously gives that low latency, fast write performance because of the nature of that architecture. Mm. And then just a couple of real life examples. So here we talked about lots of files. This is a customer that in a few days wrote 200 million files. And so we have, we have great call home data that, that gives us a perspective as to what customers are actually doing with their clusters and how we can continue to optimize that system. Um, and here's an example of, of, of the company, of the group doing the COVID research. This is on a hybrid system and they're getting 34 gigabytes of reads from the cluster as they're doing their analysis. Um, and that's all the caching and the intelligence in the system for the hybrid architecture that we've built being put to use. Just to point out that that 34 gigabytes on a hybrid system, we consider this a small cluster um, that these people have. So they're getting 34 gig of, of read throughput on what we would consider a smaller cluster. Um, when If these folks were using an NVMe-based cluster, you'd probably double or triple the amount of throughput that you'd see out of it as well. Yeah. And then... We've done a lot of work in the software to continue to optimize performance, and there's lots of lots of patents here we have around this. But our, our goal here is to is to build technology that works and provides benefits to every Cumulo cluster. And so, as we're looking at optimizations, we want to to build things that work great in cloud, that work great on all NVMe, that work great on hybrid, um, and is is accessible to all customers. And we continue to innovate and go forward as we push push to improve the systems and, and unlock the full potential of the platform that we're running on.